Well, thank you, Lord. As we're continuing with our study in uh, living, the living covenant, which is actually a root from living faith, and uh, we've been studying scriptures related to the covenant, and I told you it's not going to be in any specific order. It will probably just be like at random. We just pick up scriptures and we're reading, and we're trying to draw from scriptures. You see, the Word of God is very powerful. The Word of God is very powerful. Some people think sometimes when you read the scriptures and you talk about it, it's not powerful. This is the most powerful thing in our lives right now, is the scriptures, is God's word. Now, must understand this here, if the Holy Spirit has to do something in your life, He can't use anything else. He can't. There's nothing else the Holy Spirit can use. He can only use His word. Are you listening? So if He's going to do something in you, He's going to see whether you have His Word. If not, He can't do it. You understand? We, we might have a, a strong life of prayer, life of fasting and prayer, and uh, even a strong life of worship and thanksgiving. And all those things are wonderful because they build us up, right? They make us strong. But He can't use that. To a large extent, He can't even use our prayer. Why? Because in our prayer, what we are praying is waiting to hear the word come out in our prayer. Not what only our desires are. In fact, when we're praying to him, we must be able to quote scriptures relating to that need. You understand? And when we back our prayer up like that with the word of God, then the Holy Spirit is all ears. Because that's what he can use. That's the only thing he can ever use. Just like our God, when he created everything, what did he use? He used his word. And Jesus Christ... The Bible says, was God's word manifest in the flesh. So if you want to know what Jesus is, Jesus is the word of God who came here in the flesh. So we cannot say the word of God is not important. That is why some churches around the world, especially these seeker-friendly churches, they don't teach the word. They don't teach the word. They give a, the people, you know, uh, 20 minutes of motivational talk. That's not what that is. That is not what church life is. Church life is total devotion to God, firstly, to worship and prayer and thanksgiving and fasting. But the foundation for that whole thing is the Word. Without the Word, those things have no foundation. So let's just read scripture now. We're going to read from Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 and verse 11. But this, but this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So in other words, he's not talking about that old covenant now. He's talking about a new covenant and its operation will be different. The old covenant operation was that the law was written on the tablets. Are you listening? It was written on the tablets of stone. That's where the law was written. And the people, they had to obey what was written on the tablets of stone. You understand? But now he's talking about something else now. He says, but this is the new covenant. This operation is totally different now. This is what I'll do. I, I, this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day. On which day? On the day that Jesus Christ died shed his blood and died. On that day, I will make a new covenant with, with these people, with the Israelites. All right, the Lord says, and I will put my laws in their minds. Now, before that, the laws were not in their minds. It was written where? On tablets of stone. Are you, are you listening? So when Moses wrote the law, when Moses gave the law, he wrote it out. So whenever the people congregated, they had to read from the law and remind themselves of the law. So that they can heed to the laws of God. Alright? But this covenant is different. I will, I will put my laws in their minds. So in other words, it won't just be on a tablet or in a book. It will be in their minds. Now in the old covenant, that was not possible. Why? Because the blood of the animals were not powerful enough to cleanse the people's minds. But in the new covenant... The blood of Jesus Christ is strong enough to cleanse us in our minds and then also in our conscience. Listen to what he says here. 
I will put my laws in their minds, firstly, and I will write them where? On their hearts. The word hearts here actually means conscience. So it will be on their minds and it will be in their conscience. You know, David was a man that was very advanced. He, he lived ahead of his time, basically. If you study the life of David, he lived you know, well ahead of his time. He was more like a New Testament kind of man. You know, in one of the Psalms, he says, he says Lord, God, your, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. That man had an aroused conscience. How did that happen? I don't know. Maybe it was the anointing that he carried. But you're talking about old covenant now. Now that's the same thing that happens here. I will write my laws on their minds and I will write them on their hearts, on their consciences. I will be their God and they will be my people. You know what a powerful statement that bottom statement is. <laughs> we can't take that lightly. What does, actually, what does that actually mean? The last statement. I will be their God and they will be my people. What do you think that means? How deep you think that is? You think it's just shallow as, as it sounds? No, it's very deep. I'll tell you what it means. I will be their God. Firstly, what is the definition of God? What is the definition of the meaning of the word God? You know, it means all sufficient one. Right? And they will be my people. This is, this is what God is saying to them. I will write my laws on their minds. I will write it on their consciences. And I will be their all-sufficient one. And they will be my responsibility. That's what that means. You think that's light? <laughs> that's not light-hearted. Don't you think so? God is saying to them, I'm going to take my word, which is my law in the new covenant. I'm going to write it on your minds. I'm going to write it on your consciences. All right? And then, I'm going to be your all-sufficient one. And you are going to be my responsibility. You're going to be my people. Isn't that wonderful? Now, if you tell me, if that scripture doesn't change your prayer life, what will change your prayer life? See, that is why it's important to study the word. If you're not here studying the word, you wouldn't know that, right? So now you can pray in a different way. So when you say to God, God, you promised in your word, in this new covenant, that you'll be my all-sufficient one, Father. And I am your responsibility. That is the first step of faith. It's not how much you can give or how much you can sow and how much you can reap or how much you, your harvest is. That's not the first step. The first step is acknowledging who God is to you, your all-sufficient one, and acknowledging that you are God's responsibility. He, you are God's child. He is your daddy. You understand? He is your daddy. So, all right, uh, Verse 11, please. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already. Why? Because of the spirit of the word. You must understand, the law never come in the spirit. The law of Moses didn't come in the spirit, even though Moses was an anointed man. But it was not in the spirit. So in other words, you've got to carry the law around you all the time. You've got to write it all over your door, everywhere. You've got to write the law to remind yourself what the law is saying. Okay? You've got to write it on your hands, write it on your palms. So in order for you to remember it. But now the new covenant is a covenant of the spirit. The word of God is alive in the new covenant. So now we don't have to go around and take the law and show the people. No, 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 no. They already have it on their minds and in their consciences. People will pick it up in their consciences. They'll pick it up in their minds. So the Bible says even the least to the greatest will know me already. It's amazing how babies know Jesus. It's amazing. I don't know if you, it, it, it shocks you. It shocks me sometimes. I mean, it's so little. But anything about Jesus, they know. And they like, you know, like our little two. When, when a Jesus song is, is on, the, on the TV for them, they, they, they're watching. They know this is a Jesus song. You understand? And Haley can talk, so she can say Jesus. The other one is still learning. But what I'm saying is that even as little as they are, you know, as little as they are, they know God. So when Tati was about three years of age, <clears throat> she was in a preschool. And she had a friend. There were a lot of children there with her. 
So one day, a five-year-old was talking to this three-year-old and something. And he, had to, and he made a mistake, a good one, mind you, and he mentioned the word God. So Tati, at the age of three, asked him, who is God? Who is God? So he stayed quiet, apparently. He never answered. He don't know how to answer that question. He's five-year-old, you understand? But this brilliant three-year-old now knows who is God. So she asked him again, who is God? He stayed quiet. Then she asked him again, what is his name? He stayed quiet. Then I asked her, okay, baby, what did you tell him? She said, she said I told him that his name is Jesus Christ. And that child wasn't a Christian, mind you. He comes from a Hindu home. He is getting the gospel. Five-year-old is getting the gospel message from a three-year-old. Now you tell me that even children have a conscience, even children are so alert that the Lord, the Holy Spirit is working even in, in their lives. Let's go to chapter 10, please. Verse 11, yeah. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. You can see that? So every day the priest will be there. He'll be offering, making the offering and the sacrifices every day. But that sacrifices can never take away sins. What does it do then? It covers sins. You understand? The difference between the blood of the animals and the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of the animals cover the sins. So when God looks at the people, he sees the blood of the animals. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from those sins. It's different, okay? It's not the same thing. All right, uh, verse 12. But our high priest, who is Jesus Christ, all right? But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time, once and for all. All right? Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. The Bible says God has seated him down at his right hand at the throne. Verse 13. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. Alright, now I don't have time to dig into this. This is a powerful verse of scripture, but it has to do with the last days that we're living in right now. Okay, it has to do with that. Maybe I'll talk about that some other time. Verse 14. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. So in other words, when people ask you, you're perfect. Yes, you are. In Christ, that is. All right? You are perfect. But God is what is God doing to us? He's making us holy. He's separating us. That's the meaning of the word holiness. It means to be set apart. It means to be separated. That's what God is doing. Verse 15. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, verse 16, This is the new covenant I will make with my people. The repetition here. Yeah? I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Alright? The same thing. It's just a repetition. But the, this is what the Holy Spirit is saying. This is a very important part. Verse 17, please. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. I will never again remember their sins and their lawless deeds. Let's just do verse 18. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. So, you can see the new covenant came into power through the blood of Jesus Christ. The old covenant came into power by the blood of animals and the blood of men through circumcision, right? So, that one sacrifice Jesus Christ made, okay, and when, when our sins are forgiven, it shall not be remembered anymore. Now, in order for us to get to the root of that verse of scripture, in verse 17 we read, we've got to ask one very important question. What is the root of sin? What is the root of sin? 
Lucifer was an angel, right? What did Lucifer do that was regarded as sin? That he got thrown out of heaven? No. He rejected God. So the root of sin is what? Rejection of God. All the other things that people do are just the fruit. The root. That is why when someone comes to Christ, they confess to him, Lord, I'm a sinner. Okay, that is now talking about what? The root. What makes you a sinner? You've been rejecting God all the time. Okay, but now I accept you. See now, I receive you. So there's no rejection now. So that sin, that root has been dealt with. But many, many people, you might know many of them, that come and they say the sinner's prayer, and they give their lives to Jesus, and Jesus Christ becomes Lord of their lives. And then you might see very little change in their lives, in their habits, in their ways, you know, in the way they talk. In, in, in fact, some of them still keep their old ways, because the old ways are just fruit. But that fruit has to be destroyed. You understand? Now we have to be intelligent, spiritually intelligent to know that that person is saved. In spite of the fruit they're bearing. Because that fruit that they are bearing is not coming from the nature they have. The fruit they're bearing is coming from the nature they had. Which was the sin nature of Adam. Now they've got the nature of Christ. So many of these people, what they do is habitual. They, 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 that's what they've been doing their whole life. You understand? This is what they have been doing their whole life. And for some of them, because it is so ingrained in the system of life and the operation and the way they think, it's so difficult for them to actually cut themselves away from that, from those habits and this fruit that they've been bearing. That is the reason why one of the most important things, two things are actually very important when someone gives their life, life to Christ. Water baptism, baptism is one of it. Okay, must take them through to water baptism because then, because water baptism is a confession of their faith. It's a public confession of their faith in Christ. The other thing is Holy Spirit baptism. Doesn't matter how hard you preach against these people, you cannot change them. Doesn't matter. And some preachers need to learn that. Doesn't matter how much you condemn them, they don't have the ability to undo things in their lives or have the ability to change their habits, change their ways. But there is one person who is faithful. And if we can baptize them in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will help them. Now, going back, mind, conscience. So, what God said He's going to do, He's going to write the, His word where, His laws where? In their mind and in their conscience. So, what does the Holy Spirit do now when they get Holy Spirit baptized? He works on their conscience. Then all of a sudden, they go apologize to somebody. And say, yeah, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have spoken like that to you. But before the Holy Spirit baptism, it's like the consciences were not alive. They can just do it. And walk away, thinking they've done right. But now the Holy Spirit nudges them. So he's the only one that can correct people with an inward conviction. Not an outward condemnation. I'm not saying that we must condone sin and all that. We must talk about it. But all the words we speak cannot change them until the Holy Spirit works that word that is in the mind and that is in their conscience to bring deliverance upon them. All right? I must understand these things because this is all part of what? The new covenant. Let's jump over quickly to Hebrews 13. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to His name. You see how important this is, church. Now we belong to Him now. We don't go to the altar and make sacrifices every day, like in the old covenant. The priests don't do that anymore. 
But we do go to the altar with our own praise and our own thanksgiving. Not the little altar what the people build with stones. I'm talking about the altar of our heart. So we go to God with continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to the name of Jesus Christ. So in other words, <coughs> praising our God, worshipping our God, is, is a sacrifice that we now bring to God. It's not anymore like what the old covenant used to do. Verse 16. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. See, that's also part of the sacrifice. These are the sacrifices that please God. You know, in this past week alone, I had two people, two people, one was an individual man, another person is a family man actually asked me for food because they had no food. Can you believe that? You know, we've never had people being so bold before. And I don't think that boldness is coming from anywhere else besides the desperation in them. Now, now we cannot give a deaf ear to that. You understand? We cannot be deaf. So the first man, when I met him, I gave him, I actually gave him a lift and he was giving me some stories and I felt so sorry for him. I took his address down, but and then whatever money I had in my wallet, I just stopped there, pulled off the car where he was getting off, and gave him whatever I had there, you know, for, to, to just help him along. And this other family, I'm going to take care of them tomorrow, I'll go buy them a whole lot of groceries, you know, and stuff. So, th why am I doing that? I'm not doing to, to I'm only sharing that with you to, for you to know that whatever I do, it's also a sacrifice on the altar to God. Why? Because I swear allegiance to whose name? To the name of Jesus Christ. Are you listening? It's just a pity we don't have time to dig deeper into this, but it's such a powerful part of our lives in this new covenant. Verse 17. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Okay, in this context, that's me. Obey your spiritual leaders, do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to who? Who are we accountable to? God. So don't mess around with this. Church folks mess around too much. They actually have disrespect for, their, for that spiritual leader whom God has placed there. Not here, but I'm just saying in some, in some ministries they like that. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. You know, <laughs> I wish I had more time. This part of here is such a serious part. Only God knows when I come here on a Sunday morning to stand here in front of you or any other meeting to do the service, I first look at who's not here and my heart gets heavy. I don't know what they're going through. Okay, I don't know what their problem is. But I'm not a happy man. I'm only beca I become rested and relaxed and get into doing the ministry when the anointing comes upon me. Then the Holy Spirit asks me now to forget about the people that are not here and just focus on those that are here. You all don't know. You'll have no idea whatsoever what we go through. You'll have no idea whatsoever. All right? So that means if I do ministry with, with joy instead of sorrow, sorrow won't be a benefit to you. But if I do ministry in joy, that will be a benefit to you. Verse 18, please. Pray for us, for our conscience is clear and we want to live honorably in everything we do. This is the Apostle speaking. All right, verse 19. And especially pray that I will be able to come back to you soon. Okay, verse 20. Now may the God of peace, we won't be able to complete this tonight, but let's read it. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, this, I tell you, this verse is anointed. Now may the God of peace, I'm actually getting drunk here. Who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. Whoa. Verse 21. May he equip you with all that you need for doing his will. May he, God, our daddy, our father, Produce in you, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to Him. All glory to Him forever 
and ever. Amen. A scripture he is anointed. You know, we've been reciting this for so many weeks now. This is so powerful. My head is spinning at the moment. I'm telling you what God wants to do this two verses of scripture. He wants to make it to become a reality in our ministry. Don't take this lightly. The scriptures are very, very powerful. The Holy Spirit has given me revelation upon revelation upon revelation regarding these two verses. That one day when I was reading this thing, I said, Lord, looks like you just put this verse of scripture in the Bible just for me. Because I own this thing. But that's the whole idea here. As a child of God, you own the word. You own it. You make it yours. You know, you make it yours. Lord, this is mine. You wrote this here for me. Looks like I'm, you just wrote it just for me. I don't know about the others, but this is for me. And there's volumes and volumes of truth in this, just those two verses. But we have to read that in the context of what we just read.